Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to welcome you this morning to our first plenary session of the day, What's Happening to Early Childhood Progressive Education? It's a big question indeed. Um, I'm sitting here with three incredible women, each of whom I've admired for their, the work that they've done and the, 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 um, the, the work that they bring to us all. Um, and we're going to have an opportunity to hear from them and hear each unique perspective. Um, we're going to have an opportunity to hear from them for a select period of time. Then we're going to let them chat amongst themselves a little bit. And then we're going to put, the, um, put you to the task of asking some questions. Um, all their bios are available in your packet. So I thought instead of reiterating simply what you could already read yourselves, that I asked each speaker to tell me what it is that brought them to the field of early childhood education and what is it that sustains them here today. And it was very interesting to, to hear. So I'm going to start with Sarah Wilford. Uh, Sarah is the director of the Art of Teaching graduate program here at Sarah Lawrence College. Sarah came to education as a young mother of five children who spanned nine years. It was time for her to return to work, but it had to be something that fit in her children's lives. Little did she know that she would fall in love with teaching young children at first, most particularly, with the first and second graders she taught at public schools. Coming to Sarah Lawrence brought with the challenges and opportunities of being on a psychology faculty, serving as director of a historically eminent early childhood center, and being asked to design a graduate program in early childhood and elementary education. You don't mess around here. You give people a lot of responsibility. <laughs> um, uh, traveling to visit early childhood programs in other countries has forced her to grow as well. So as Sarah states so eloquently, as you grow, you learn, and as you learn, you come to love your work more and more. So Sarah Wilford, welcome. Be Beverly Falk is professor and the director of the graduate programs in early childhood education at the City College of New York. She was drawn to early childhood education because it addresses how understandings of human development can be applied to learning, taking all aspects of the child into consideration. She was especially drawn to the field's focus on learning through meaningful, purposeful, active experiences and its emphasis on constructing understandings as opposed to rote learning. Beverly has found working in early childhood education to be exciting because it's a developmental period in which the architecture of the brain and the dispositions for lifelong learning are constructed. It's a time of great hope where human potential is most apparent and can be affected most powerfully. She has also found the work to be socially and politically relevant because it must engage parents, caregivers, families, and thus touches on issues of access and equity that are fundamental to our democracy, not only for children, but for women, families, and communities of different cultures, languages, and socioeconomic backgrounds. The work of early childhood education is robust and joyful, and that's why she chose it many years ago, and that's why she remains in the field today. Welcome, Beverly. <laughs> and Rima Shore serves as the Adelaide Weissman Chair in Educational Leadership at Bank Street College of Education. While finishing a doctorate in Russian literature that focused on Gogol and Dostoevsky, R Rima earned extra money by writing speeches and annual reports for a number of New York City school's chancellors. Both pursuits made her curious about how the human mind develops. <laughs> <laughs> For some time, she taught Russian literature by day and wrote about early childhood at night. Did you do that in Russian or English? No. <laughs> um, and eventually, education became her day job. What keeps her in the field? 30 years ago, she was interested in how the mind develops. Now, as new insights emerge daily, she is totally fascinated by the topic and by the cultural factors that shape the way our society responds to the needs of children. That's really short. Well, So Sarah's going to be our first speaker this morning. No, we're going to stay right here. Right here. Stay right here. Okay. Be comfy. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to have to try to juggle this because I had an image that I would have space between what I'd like to share with you, and but here we are. So um, this morning, um, my lens is one of, uh, uh, of the roots, if you will, or some of the roots of early childhood education. and. I take a really broad view of progressive early childhood education. Pro probably comes from uh, teaching foundations of education here for many years. Um, and my fascination with observers of young children across the ages. Um, I'm struck by the fact that through the centuries, 
observers of young children who really took the time to watch them at different stages of their development and growth um, develop themselves a developmental perspective and an appreciation for children's ability to learn by doing. So I thought oh, here we, we're, we're in this stage of thinking of three things or three persons. Um, and we, we heard last night from uh, Joseph Featherstone about three important figures. Um, but I also decided quite a while ago that I wanted to uh, speak a little bit about three very important figures for me. I'm fascinated by Jean-Jacques Rousseau because wherever did he develop the extraordinary insight to create Emile, published in 1762, that imaginary pupil and his young tutor. You know, though full of social messages related to his antipathy towards the church and his vision for a social contract, Rousseau's Emile has never felt to me like an abstract child. Um, and this from a man who was himself severely neglected as a child and as an adult, which is awful to think about, sent all his children off to be raised by other people when they were very small. So here we are with Emile's young tutor, cautioned to be clear and firm with his pupil, um, a good early childhood teacher that I think Dewey would have, um, would have admired, a teacher who knows that young children learn through their senses, who allows young Emile to explore nature, to discover aspects of the world for himself. And in a priceless description of Emile's invitation uh, to a birthday party, an invitation he cannot read, Rousseau tells us, um, it's his desire to read that the tutor will use to help him learn. Um, so I'm also drawn to Johann Pestalozzi, um, born in 1746. Uh, and this sounds corny in terms of why I'm drawn to him, but he's so dear. He really is. Uh, he grew up in poverty with minimal education. He hated the idea of strict discipline and rote memorization, which in those few years of schooling he'd been subjected to. And he tells us a story which is also uh, loaded with uh, Christian moralizing. You kind of have to get past that a little bit when you're reading it. But he tells a story of hands-on learning that permeates the home of his fictional Leonard and Gertrude. And if you've uh, never seen that, you should take a look at it. It's, uh, it's quite wonderful. So Pestalozzi's love of children and teaching were intense, and they drove him to found his own schools, um, particularly a school in Yverdon in Switzerland. Um, and um, he was constantly seeking ways to make learning meaningful. Uh, his teaching principles were both timeless and progressive. Begin with a concrete object before you introduce abstract concepts. Begin with the immediate environment before dealing with what is distant and remote. Begin with easy exercises before introducing complex ones. Always proceed gradually, cumulatively, and slowly. But then along comes Friedrich Froebel, born about four years after Pestalozzi, and him I especially love. And not just because he's called the father of the kindergarten, but because many of his beliefs are based on reflective discoveries of his very tough childhood. Uh, he, he manages to, uh, I'm, I really do want to be a little naughty and share this with you, he brings sex into his autobiographical writings. Um, and there's this wonderful piece. Um, his, his father was a pastor responsible for 5,000 parishioners. And so as a young child, his mother had died very, very early. Uh, he listened to the counseling that went on. Uh, and much of the counseling had to do with marital problems around sex. So he became extremely interested in this and he got laden by this thought of, well, how do people ever get together and what do they do? And when his big brother came back to spend some time at the home, 
uh, his big brother took him out into the garden and he showed him the hazel buds and the th purple threads of the hazel buds. And he began to talk about in nature how there were male and female differences. And suddenly, all this guilt lifted um, off of Froebel. Uh, and he could see that this coming together, this was sort of the beginning of his idea of unity in nature, um, happening very early on. Um, so he goes on, he does many things, he muses about unity as he labors at forestry. He's many years of being a family tutor, um, and then he creates the wooden blocks that become the gifts children explore and build with um, in schools of his own. Uh, many years later, these little blocks played a large role in Frank Lloyd Wright's childhood, and I have to give this short quote. I sat at the little kindergarten tabletop, <clears throat> ruled by lines about four inches apart, <clears throat> pardon me, each way making four inch squares. And among other things, played upon these unit lines with the squares, the circle, and the triangle. These were smooth maple blocks. Eventually, I was to construct designs in other mediums, but the smooth cardboard triangles and maple wood blocks were the most important. All are in my fingers to this day. So the work of all these men, Rousseau, Pestalozzi, and Froebel, were felt in early childhood education experiments in the United States. In Pestalozzi's case, early childhood schools, introduced as Pestalozzianism, if I can say that right, were founded for wealthy and poor children in major US Eastern cities as early as the 1830s. A Froebel-inspired kindergartens first appeared as schools for German immigrant children in the 1850s and 60s. And championed by American educator Elizabeth Peabody, their popularity spread. <clears throat> and the whole idea of kindergarten for young children of all backgrounds really was the fuel of the public school kindergarten movement. Froebel's influence on early childhood educators in the U.S. held until the early 1900s, followed by a, a brief period of enthusiasm for the Montessori methods and school's pattern on her inspired work in Rome's in, impoverished San Lorenzo district. And if you ever have a chance to read that in the Montessori method, uh, the story of, of her creation of those schools is amazing. But the influence of John Dewey soon became paramount. So here we go to the big P, right? <clears throat> Which I'll try to do quickly, Lorraine. Um, experience, interaction, continuity, freedom, purpose, democracy. Only a few of the big concepts Dewey explored in his work. The need for a theory of experience certainly included his respect for the child's right to play. And Patty Smith Hill, creator of the unit blocks we so prize today as part of early childhood classrooms, was an influential Deweyan educator. Here's her definition of free play. In free play, the self makes its own choices, selections and decisions, and thus absolute freedom is given to the play of the child's images and volition in expressing them. In New York City, the Bureau of Educational Experiments, later Bank Street College of Education, published descriptions of a number of new schools between 1917 and 1924. So in her fascinating book, I Learned from Children, Caroline Pratt describes the founding and evolution of city and country school, which I'm happy to say still flourishes today, uh, a school that placed highest priority on sustaining autonomous individuality within a democratically organized school society. Harriet Johnson, Lucy Sprague Mitchell, and Barbara Biber at Bank Street, Lois Murphy at Sarah Lawrence, Joseph Stone at Vassar, and many, many others helped the progressive movement by focusing on early childhood education. I'm gonna read a quote from Biber, uh, reflecting on the early school years, something she uh, wrote in the 1980s. <clears throat> Not only was nursery school defended as a suitable beginning of education 
It was perceived as a lever for basic change in education in the large, a way of making a breakthrough toward a whole new philosophy of education. This conception of nursery school education was a built-in phase of the progressive education movement with a common body of basic principles and purposes. At another level, there is something tender in this loving, albeit somewhat romanticized image of what transpires in nursery school, and something sad in the naive faith that as soon as the plans and programs of modern educators come to fulfillment, the old school will be a museum piece to be set up beside the city's first fire engine. As soon as is taking a long time. Now, I, I could end there, but I can't because I have this reputation of being an impossible person who always has the glass half full. And uh, yeah, I agree with this is where we should stop, but I can't do it. So here, this is just a, a moment more. So here are some places where I've been privileged to learn from children, all of which, as in our own schools, are experiencing increased diversity. There are schools in Great Britain holding on to their primary school revolution history. There are progressive schools in New Zealand and Australia still clinging to their British infant school origins. There are striking and exciting early childhood schools in all the Scandinavian countries, all of them. Uh, where teachers of young children are honored alongside teachers of elementary and high school students, where curriculum is both appropriate and creative. And then there are the inspiring schools of Reggio Emilia and other municipalities in northern Italy, which only get better. So I leave you on an upbeat note, and I look forward to the perspectives, perhaps less rosy, of our distinguished speakers to come. <laughs> I'd like to add to Sarah's list that there are some schools right here in our city and in our country that are also carrying on the ideals of progressive education and um, facing the many challenges that we have right here in our own country. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. Um, some of the challenges we face and some of the good news we have as well. We're living in a time right now of high stakes accountability. Uh, played out through imposition of standards for what's required to exit high school that are being pushed down further and further into the early grades. We're living in a time where we have school leaders who often know very little about early childhood education, but are running schools for young children in the public sector in particular. And we're living in a time where corporate initiatives are finding all sorts of ways to profit off of all of these different uh, initiatives. But on the other hand, we also have some advancements and some hopes that I think are important to focus on. There is an increased understanding and emphasis on early childhood right now, uh, and the power and importance of early childhood as shaping, having the potential to shape people's lives. And that's good and bad, because if those um, understandings about early childhood are actually enacted into policy, that will raise dangers for more standards and more mandates to dictate the kind of work that we do. But that's where we come in. Um, as a profession, which we must claim ourselves as. The other, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, but the really good news is that everything that Sarah just spoke about in our history, the history of progressive education from Rousseau to Pestalozzi to Froebel to Dewey and his amazing, powerful women colleagues, um, to the works of Paulo Freire uh, more recently, to the theories of the cognitive scientists who through their empirical studies 
documented the kind of learning that was uh, given image of, given images of by Rousseau. And now, in the most recent decades, the findings from neuroscience coming out of <clears throat> brain research are actually proving that the theories that we hold dear are actually indeed the way children learn. And that is something that can only give us more strength. I just want to review some of what those powerful understandings are about learning that we now have proof are the way people learn. We know that learning is about constructing understandings and making sense of the world. And as Eleanor Duckworth would say, the having of wonderful ideas. We also know that children learn through experience, active experience with materials and relationships and meaningful, purposeful, real life contexts. And that play is the medium in which this happens for young children. In that medium, they learn critical skills, such as making appropriate choices among many possibilities, using their imagination, improvising, thinking flexibly, exploring new options, becoming aware of our interests, solving problems, cooperating with others, working through feelings in creative ways, persevering, using something to represent something else, and seeing themselves as competent and interesting people with good ideas. There are other things that we know. We know that the early years are critical for establishing the architecture of the brain and the foundation for lifelong learning. Brain research now informs us that in the first years of life, the brain makes over 700 neural connections every second. We know that social, emotional, and physical development are critical to this cognitive development. We know that responsiveness to and inclusion of families and culture, language, and community are essential to supporting children's learning. And we know that young children's development is uneven. They learn in different ways, through different strengths, and at different paces. So given these understandings, I think there's some common ideas that we hold about what education should be. We know that the role of the teacher is as a facilitator and co-learner, not just a transmitter of information. We know that multiple forms of authentic evidence in authentic contexts of children's learning is the most accurate and robust kind of assessment. These common principles are enhanced by some common values that probably all of us in this room share today that are rooted in the perspectives of the progressives. That education and life should not be separate, but that they go together. That the purpose of education is about developing human capacity, not simply serving corporate and managerial ends and that envisioning the school as a community of learners who are to be nurtured, to be critical and creative thinkers, who can apply knowledge to both pose and solve problems, that that is the way to prepare citizens for an equitable and active participation in our democracy. So these are the common understandings that we as a community of progressive educators have inherited, have developed, and now can be supported in understanding that there is evidence to document that this is the way things should be. But there are also differences amongst us. We're not a monolithic group. And it's interesting, I was doing some reading in preparation for today, and one of the things that I think it was in an essay by Joseph Featherstone that I read in a book that came out of the institution that I I'm a part of City College. Uh, many years ago, there was a center called the Workshop Center for Open Education, and it was started by Lillian Weber, who was my teacher. Um, and in the early 70s, there was a conference called The Roots of Open Education, and a book was produced out of that, and Joseph Featherstone was one of the speakers. Um, 
And he talked about how there were differences amongst the progressives. They varied in the degree to which they felt knowledge should be imposed on the learner as opposed to individually discovered. They differed on where curriculum comes from, whether it was external or from within. And they differed on the degree to which motivation is intrinsic or extrinsic, on the role of the teacher in the environment, and on numerous other matters. And that's where we see all these different variations of, in the independent school movement of the different kinds of progressive schools, even here in New York City. Well, today we have similar variations. And they're played out in the discourse about standards and assessments for students and teachers, and about emergent versus teacher-designed curricula, and about charter versus public schools, and about other strategies for school improvement. And yet, I think, facing the challenges that I started out by talking about, it's essential that we find some common ground so that we can be a united community to advocate for children for meeting their individual, developmental, and educational needs. We have a lot of work to do, and here's what I think we need to do. We need to take a stand for what we believe in. We need to express this stand to policymakers and school administrators and teachers and the general public so that help them understand how young children learn. We need to talk about that the most effective way children learn, the most effective way they can even meet the rigorous expectations of the common core standards to be college and career ready, is not to push down the same teaching methods that happen in the high schools, but to help young children learn through experience, through active learning, through play. We need to make sure that we have caring and safe environments that engage families and communities as partners in the learning process in all of our schools. And we need to advocate for assessments that look at the whole child, that offer multiple forms of evidence of growth, and that recognize the developmental variation of young children. Not that every kindergartner must be able to complete a certain set of skills by the end of kindergarten. We know that young children vary in the way they learn. They have different strengths and different paces and different ways of going about learning. How do we do this? Well, I hearken back to the words of my teacher Lillian Weber. She used to say, to us all the time, look for the cracks. It's through the cracks in the sidewalk that the grass can grow. I believe we all need to look for the cracks where the grass of genuine learning and understanding can be nourished and flourished. Our challenge, and this is particularly hard to find within the public school system, particularly in the high-need communities where people, for whatever their motivations are, are and, and lack of understandings, are pushing practices that don't support learning. I believe we need to relentlessly advocate for learning experiences that match the way children learn and that keep the joy of learning alive. We need to work on this goal in many different ways. And that's why, where we don't need to agree on everything. We don't all need to do the same thing. There's room for each of us to tackle and challenge from a variety of stances. We can, from the outside critique that pose images of possibility, to the insider's efforts to influence and impact the constrained realities in today's schools. Some of us will speak out against policies and practices in articles and blogs and rallies and meetings. And others of us will work within the system to influence existing policies and procedures. Some will create schools that aim to realize a more exciting, empowering vision of child-centered teaching. And others will seek to find ways in their own classrooms 
to infuse what we know about what is appropriate for children's development and learning in the sidewalk cracks of less appropriate mandated curricula and pacing schedules. Some will fight for more equitable funding for public schools. Some will work to develop more useful and appropriate assessments of learning. Others will work to develop more effective teacher and leadership education and professional development or more just and humane educational policies. And others of us will engage in research either that examines the impact of policies that go against what we believe is good teaching or that documents rich images of teaching in ways that children learn. Each of these approaches are important and needed. Through them, we advocate for children and carry on the work of building a profession that serves de democratic education. One that, as John Dewey put it, provides for all children what the best and wisest parent wants for his or her child. We'll, I think I'll end with that. I had, I had a quote, maybe I will. Um, we'll be helping the world understand, as Malaguzzi, the founder of the Reggio Schools, has said, that the child has a hundred languages, a hundred hands, a hundred thoughts, a hundred ways of thinking, of playing, of speaking, a hundred, always a hundred ways of listening, of marveling, of loving, a hundred joys for singing and understanding, a hundred worlds to discover, a hundred worlds to invent, a hundred worlds to dream. The child has a hundred languages and a hundred, hundred, hundred more. Good morning. As Lorraine said, I'm a bit of an accidental tourist to this field, and I see in the audience so many people who have spent their lives dedicated to the early childhood field. I want to in particular acknowledge Nancy Balaban, um, our, my Bank Street colleague who I see here today. And I, I know there are many others. Uh, it's true, I started out teaching Russian literature before emigrating to progressive education. It was a fairly smooth border crossing, going from authors like uh, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy to John Dewey. So I went from crime and punishment to experience and education, <laughs> and from war and peace to freedom and culture. <laughs> and in both fields, it's the ends that matter most, the narratives and values and ideas that connect disparate concepts or seemingly disparate concepts. And that's where I wanted to head uh, in my remarks today, and I hope you'll follow me as we take some twists and turns along the way. I worked as an interpreter in the 70s, taking groups of Americans and Soviets to visit early childhood centers and schools in each other's countries. And in the early 90s, I headed up a program at Brooklyn College that prepared Soviet emigres, mainly teachers, to work in New York City public schools. They didn't know what they had in store. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time unpacking the experiences that they brought with them. And one day, the conversation turned to how the school year typically begins. And they told me that teachers in the Soviet Union would report to schools a week early to clean the rooms and sometimes to paint them. And a woman named Celia said, we had to do everything. We'd spend our own money on basic supplies. I even had to buy my own classroom mirror. And I said, you're, you're what? And she said, our classroom mirror. I said, what's that? And she said, you know, the classroom mirror. Every classroom has to have a mirror. So I wanted to know why, and she said, so you can check yourself. And I thought, you mean the teacher, like check your makeup or something like that? And she said, no, everyone, the kids, the teachers, you have to check yourself. And I said, wouldn't you want to do that in private, like in the restroom? <laughs> and she said, you need a classroom mirror. So I did a quick survey, and most of the group recalled having mirrors in their rooms, and 
I certainly recalled large mirrors by the entrance of every public building in Leningrad where I had um, gone to school for a time. So I pressed the issue. I wanted to know what role did the mirror play in the curriculum, given that Celia had to have one even if it meant buying it herself. And they thought this was a little silly and they said, but it's just a mirror. And I said, okay, let's call it a reflecting device. <laughs> Why would a reflecting device be standard issue in school? And it became clear after a while that checking yourself in public had something to do with non-privacy or the opposite of privacy, with seeing yourself in the company of your classmates as part of a collective and with seeing yourself as other sees you and maybe something about a consciousness that you're being seen. So what this experience brought home to me was that for them, the mirror was invisible. I was reminded of the saying, that the fish are the last to know about water. Uh, and I began to wonder, what is it in our classrooms that we don't see? So some of these Soviet emigres had kids in New York preschools or schools, so I asked them to tell me what seemed odd to them that I might not notice, and they laughed. There were so many things. For one, the way kids in American schools stay in their seats when the teacher walks into the room, they said, you know, like, don't they know that this is disrespectful? And why do we mix up even the youngest kids at the end of the year just when they're getting comfortable with each other? They had gone through school with the same class. I mean, literally the same 30 kids from first grade through high school graduation year after year. And I said that, of course, we want our kids to socialize with a lot of different classmates so they really understand diversity and they said, you mean you want your four-year-olds to network? <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so I began to think, what is it we don't see in our classroom starting in early childhood? And of course, one of the answers, and um, uh, Joe Featherstone referred to this last night, is what we call the hidden curriculum, the norms and rules that are transmitted through our culture, but you won't find them spelled out in any textbook. Well, and then I spent time talking about this with my brother, Brad Shore, an anthropologist who actually taught here at Sarah Lawrence for a few years. And he thought I shouldn't just think about hidden content. What's hardest to see, he said, is not just the things we think about, but the things we think with. The structures, metaphors, patterns that are so deeply embedded in our culture that without noticing, we filter our perceptions and experience and creations through them called this mental model. I think it's what Anais Nin was talking about when she said, we don't see things the way they are, we see things the way we are. Mm -hmm. So in conversation with Brad and my students, I started thinking about how mental models might shed light on some of the practices that have begun to seem to us inevitable and invisible, maybe not invisible, invisible. Uh, including the current mania for testing and measurement and rubrics and disaggregated data. And here is what we ended up talking about, that we Americans are great at disaggregation. We have a genius for taking things apart and putting them back together again in ever more flexible ways. When we innovate, and the world certainly expects us to innovate, we disassemble things, products, institutions, ideas, we separate them, breaking them down into their constituent parts, and then we put them back together in ever more ingenious, time-saving ways. So if you think about, and you'll have your own ideas about this, it probably will come to mind, the major contributions that Americans are known for in the world, you think about, well, in industry, we broke down the production of guns and cars and other things into discrete processes and gave the world the assembly line and in information science, we showed how data could be conceptualized as ones and zeros and recombined in infinite patterns to create a computer-based economy. And in fashion, we left haute couture primarily to the Europeans and we made our mark with mix and match, with separates. <laughs> we did. In the arts, we're known for quilts and cinema and animation. We remix and mash up our music. In retailing, we invented modular furniture and fast food. 
Berger's lettuce mustard ketchup on a sesame seed bun so you can have it your way. <laughs> and we created the mall, the retailing equivalent of recombinant DNA. In government, <laughs> we embrace the separation of powers, checks and balances, federalism. Let others be France or Fiji or Finland. We are the United, the modular United States of America. A glance at our flag tells the story. So modularity seems to be at the root of the mental model that has shaped much of what we take for granted. And if we think together about the practices and arrangements in our early childhood classrooms, I begin to wonder what is it that seems as natural or inevitable to us as the mirror seemed to Celia. So I began to think about this, and I, I wonder what you'll all think about it, and I thought about the activity centers that are now so ubiquitous in so many early childhood centers where you have the dramatic play corner, the literacy corner, the math corner, the listening corner. Uh, we used to talk about the, um, you know, the uh, uh, shopping mall high school, and I sometimes wonder if we're moving toward the shopping mall preschool. Um, and then there is also the blocks, which didn't begin in um, necessarily with Americans, but were certainly adopted um, uh, very, very enthusiastically here. The blocks that kids assemble each day, giving form and dimension to their complex inner lives before they disassemble them and return them to the shelf. The manufacturers of Legos have made a fortune on modularity. And how about in the realm of policy? Policymakers take disciplines and break them down into knowledge, skills, and dispositions that can be mixed and matched into standards, and then we use uh, multiple choice tests and rubrics and, you know, to measure progress. And in teacher education, we make sure our teachers, just as one example, know about multiple intelligences. So what does this mean for practice? Should we get rid of all these things? It's certainly helpful to recognize and explore the connections among these practices and policies. And of course, as Beverly said, we should be challenging things like disaggregation gone wild, as many of you are doing with eloquence. What about block building? Should we get those blocks off the shelves? And I say, not at all. We wouldn't want to outlaw modular art of animation or um, of uh, ready to wear clothes or cinema. Our children learn very early to put things together and then take them apart, to be flexible and inventive. We are great at that, and we are teaching them to be great, great at it. But the point here is we're not so great at coherence. We're not so great at integrity. Um, so I just want to now just take a minute to talk about the whole child. Uh, and the whole child has been mentioned a number of times last night and, and, and in this panel. If you check out the many policy papers and books and web pages devoted to this topic, it becomes very clear that we have managed to modularize the whole child. <laughs> uh, that, you know, we begin with nearly 20 years ago, um, we had uh, Kagan and Bredekamp and Moore who talked about the five domains more re of, of uh, development, physical, social, emotional, cognitive, language development, approaches to learning. More recently, we've had the five whole child tenets promulgated by ASCD. We have seven dimensions of whole child assessment adopted by Pearson. So I think we really need to um, reclaim the whole child and what's whole. I think we need to really be sure that we are looking for the through lines, that we are preparing teachers to understand um, the through lines and to look for them. Um, and uh, it's like, you know, with John Dewey, those ands matter. Finding and highlighting the through lines can mean uh, seeing the connections between the question the child asked last week and the design that, uh, of the building that the blocks take this week. It means seeing through lines between narratives and questions and um, toys and that are chosen or yanked away from a friend. 
Um, it really, and, and seeing the through lines, I think, doesn't necessarily come as easily to us as seeing the parts. Um, I've taken up the violin again as an adult, and my violin teacher tells me that I have to spend time on the up bows and have a lot of intentionality about the up bows because I don't have gravity working with me. Um, so if it, you know, and I feel like it's the same way here, thinking about wholeness, that we really have to be conscious and intentional about wholeness because it doesn't come as naturally. So, um, yeah, um, there is more, but I think we're going to leave it there. I want to just end by saying that without the through lines, we're going to be hard pressed to engage children's hearts and minds as we must if we want to end up with more democracy and education and less crime and punishment. to know if anyone wanted to take a moment to respond to one another or I know you took some time in your in your talks or comments yeah. or let's I think we'll just go right to the audience then and we'll <clears throat> let our runners we have four students who are going to person the mics for us so so if you just raise your hand one of us will come to you don't speak until you get a microphone everyone. Um, it seems to me that uh, a long time ago I did my master's thesis on nurturing behavior in children, in young children, by introducing nature into the classroom and their lives, which we've done for a very long time. But now I think we have to introduce something else, and that has to do with spirituality because that is something that, that the, the, the scriptures say addresses both mind and soul. And when you look at a child, you look at a child with both. Uh, so that, and this is what your speaker said this morning, I just call it something else. I think that has to be brought into education. That's all. Thank you. Um, you, you're making me uh, think of um, a trip to Reggio Emilia in 1993, where I was privileged to hear Malaguzzi speak. And I really felt, although certainly there was no uh, um, uh, reference to spirituality in terms of a religious way of thinking or there was always in what he said a sort of underlying implication that there was a spirituality within the child and hopefully a spirituality between the children and between the teachers and the children although that word was never used so i think we could think about that word as as being you know, as having a broad, um, I don't that a excuse me, I can't hear. I don't consider that a religious word. I consider it a combination of humanity and nature. Yes. That's what I consider it. I think you're right. I'd like to say something about the spirituality. And that is that at the time that, you know, I've been thinking about this, there is a, um, a wonderful description in uh, Louis, Louis Menard's book, The Metaphysical Club, of how John Dewey actually secularized some of the ideas about the unity of knowledge that were current uh, in, the, in his day. Uh, because, um, you know, for many, and, and I would say this was more in Europe, for many people, the idea of unity of knowledge meant in some way um, 
the unity came from some transcendence or some, from, from some understanding or sense of the absolute of divinity. And, and I think in some ways what, what Dewey and his contemporaries in America did was they took the holiness out of the whole, out of the wholeness. You know, or they took the, for, instead of communion, it, was com it became community. And um, I think some of us are actually, and I, I've sometimes felt this myself, a little uncomfortable with some of the language of holistic education because it ends up sounding kind of new agey and, um, and, 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 you know, in this era when anything that sounds unscientific is so open to attack, um, it's very um, difficult to actually talk about it, but I agree it's tremendously important and it's the root of where um, the idea of unity of knowledge and experience came from. It comes to one more thing and then I'll stop talking. Um, it comes to from nurturing behavior to the growth to stewardship of each other and the earth. That's what I think it, it, it derives from spirituality and goes to stewardship. Thanks, Karen. Simultaneous. Should should I? Yeah. Uh, I I was fascinated by uh, the argument about disaggregation as kind of the American theme, and I just wanted to tell a short story which involves Russia too, <laughs> which is um, late in his life. Uh, I was uh, I was speaking at a conference with the late union leader Albert Shanker. And Shanker and I had a love-hate relationship that went back a long time. He once blamed me for the ills of U.S. education, and I once denounced him uh, about several other big important issues. Uh, but, but we were very cordial to the end. And I told him that I was going to say some words in my talk. I just wanted to warn him. Uh, attacking a lot of his uh, recent sponsorship of a lot of the um, new agendas in the 80s for uh, testing and, and uh, disaggregation. And I, I said, you know, you've, you've promoted a lot of these reforms and they're not turning out very well. And to my surprise and to his credit, which is I think part of the love uh, as well as the hate uh, that I had for him, uh, he said, uh, I know, it's really turning out badly, he said. He said, you know, um, there's a Russian proverb, he said, you can make fish chowder out of an aquarium, but not the other way around. Hi. I have a question about positivism and the, the theory that was so dominant in the late 19th century or uh, that you could use data to make determinations. So if you had a photograph, you could divide that photograph, uh, you know, into, you could analyze it and then make conclusions about whether that person was going to become a criminal. And it just seems to me that the whole issue of using data um, is a social construct that developed in the United States in that period and that it keeps sort of emerging in different forms and at each time, every time it reemerges, it somehow serves the interests of, of, um, of the corporate. Uh, sector. And so when I think about what's been going on with sort of the privatization of education, um, it seems like this idea of positivism keeps getting used to um, 
you know, that if, if you can't support something using data that it doesn't have value um, or meaning. So could you comment on that? Because it's something that it's kind of been nagging, you know, that, that connection between where this idea comes from historically, because every, you know, it just seems like data keeps driving everything. I think I should turn this over to uh, to Beverly and, and Rima, but um, this whole push for a science of education, okay, which is sort of what you're referring to, I think, in the, the beginnings, you know, the early 1900s, um, that uh, the, the idea, there's nothing, in my opinion, wrong with the idea of data, but you're going further. You're saying it's how it's used I think, um, what it's used for. Um, so separating those pieces out, is there anything wrong with data? And um, if not, then let's talk about that. So I sort of want to turn it over. Well, I'll, I'll say a few words. Um, positivism has, was the foundation on which actually public education was grounded and, and the psychology of that era was a positivist and behaviorist understanding about development. Um, throughout the history of, of education in our country, we've seen this pendulum swing back and forth between this notion of um, behaviorist or more positive uh, paradigm and the more what we've come to call constructivist and human development view of, of learning. And uh, it's no accident uh, that it seems that positivism is always the way, the, the direction in which the pendulum is swings back. And you can look at something like Teachers College where you see that you know, a building is named after Thorndike, the creator of the standardized test, but there's only a lecture series named for John Dewey. <laughs> Um, however, uh, you know, it, the, the other paradigm is now, I believe, getting validated through research, as I mentioned before, through neuroscience and brain research, and through the continuing empirical studies of people who have been involved in work with how children learn. And, um, I think there, there is an effort also in our movement of of in our profession to find a way to merge some of the concepts from both paradigms to be useful. And if you look at really the way educators who have studied children and who support progressive ideals have worked, we have always used data to inform our practice. Teaching is about a cycle of inquiry. It's about uh, making plans, observing and documenting and collecting data about the, the impact of that, those plans in our instruction and reflecting and analyzing that data and using it to inform further teaching. And there's a big effort that's been going on in the last several decades to starting in classrooms and now moving towards larger scale assessments to have performance assessments and in authentic kinds of contexts. And I think that's a way that that's a model of how we can use data in a way to support learning and to support good teaching. And that is our challenge to keep raising that way of using data and explaining it to people in the language and the concepts that they can understand and hopefully to move practice forward. I'd just like to uh, add something um, based on, on what you said about uh, neuroscience uh, and that is that for many years now I have used Rima Shore's book, Rethinking the Brain and it seems to me uh, a wonderful beginning place to think about the possibilities um, of using this kind of knowledge and data, if you will, in our work 
with children, and it's as current for me today, uh, although you might rewrite it, um, uh, as it was when I first saw it. Maybe, maybe uh, we need to have Rethinking the Heart. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got the heart yeah. up there. Um, <coughs> you know, I think there's real, real reason to be concerned about privatization, um, and that was part of the question that was, was raised. Um, the, uh, as we're all happy to see more investments in early childhood, more public investment, but I, I think as there's more public investment, I think we have to be aware of the, um, well, we have to be wary of the uh, preschool industrial complex. Um, um, there is a, at the time that the Vietnam War was winding down, um, it was the time when performance contracting grew and a number of the defense contractors who had um, fewer contracts with the Defense Department looked to education as a place to do more business. And um, there were people who came right out of McNamara's Defense Department and went directly into education performance contracting. And by the way, there was a very big scandal in testing then that is very reminiscent of what's happened now in Atlanta. Um, and now, um, I think it's interesting to follow the money with STEM contracts um, because I um, have the sense and I've been, I think we need to kind of look at this carefully that a lot of money in the um, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math um, is going to be going to defense contractors, particularly as their contracts with the Defense Department for um, the, the Bush era wars that are winding down um, diminish. So I think we have to be very wary of this, um, including in the preschool area. Um, I'd like to go back to the question about the data that we have from neurology because it's been out there and more and more on a daily basis for 10 years or more. And yet, it, why do you believe people aren't listening to that? You know, if we are so driven by data and yet, you know, we're making choices about ignoring data, very powerful data, what, you know, is it that we're so driven by the money and the politics that people are willing to ignore the data? Or do you feel the data is not accessible enough to the average person to get them, you know, feeling like, why aren't we looking at this and taking it really seriously? Um, uh, I also think it's about how the data is used. Um, and the, the, there is a danger when someone focuses, as a very well-known uh, neuropsychologist has, um, has used it, uh, studying dyslexic children, taking that information, which is very valuable through brain imaging, serving on a committee, a government committee, and that made a decision sort of based on this work that what's good for dyslexic children is good for all children. So that's a, that's a danger that I think is inherent in this, but that's not actually the answer to your question. <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll come in a little bit. I think it has to do with the, the change process and how increasingly difficult it is in, in our media-saturated uh, world to get messages across. Uh, a, a number of years ago, I was on sabbatical and I was in the Boston area and I went to, I attended, um, I actually attended a lecture that you gave, uh, Joe, and I also attended a lecture given by um, Jack Shankoff, a series of lectures, who is the director of the Center, Harvard Center on the Developing Child, and they are a multidisciplinary science, medicine, education, psychology, group that is doing a lot of work in neuroscience. And one of the things, one of the um, presentations they made was on how they were conveying their message. And they actually hired a group, a, a public relations group, to help them 
frame talking points for how to get some of this information across. And that's where they came up with the notion of architecture of the brain. It's the foundation for all of our future learning. Um, so it, it's hard to get complex ideas out into the public. And it's also, the change process takes time and we don't give time. We don't, everything moves so fast in our world right now. I liken it to, I'm involved in a change process that's somewhat controversial right now. Um, but, and I'm a student of the change literature and I kind of liken it to like, you know when you're at a stoplight and like I, coming on the sawmill parkway and, and there's stoplights along the way and you're way in the back of the line and the light turns green but nobody's moving <laughs> and by the time you move the lights already turned red and it takes a long time for messages to get conveyed and for understandings to get developed and then there's all sorts of unintended consequences of good things that happen um, and that also have negative things that happen and we just have to stay focused on the big issues and I'll go back to my earlier remarks that we have to find some common ground, some common few big ideas that we all can uh, connect to and keep, uh, be relentless about bringing them forward and expressing them in whatever outlets, whatever cracks we can find. On the brain, I, th I think that the messages have gotten through. I think we have to think back 15 years. Um, at the time, there was a very conscious strategy to put kind of a lab coat on some of these issues. You know, I always think of issues as um, fashion statements, like we have labor, we have hard hat issues, and we have, you know, pinstripe issues with Wall Street. and early childhood was like a house coat with spit up on the shoulder, you know? And, and um, it was, it, it, early childhood issues were totally on the women's pages of the, you know, in the back of the newspaper. And there was a very conscious decision, I think, that was made to put a lab coat over that house dress. And uh, so that male legislators would have some way to vote for appropriations for early childhood without feeling that they would be necessarily ridiculed for it. And so they needed to have throwdown value. Um, and that was one of the reasons that, you know, rethinking the brain had legs at the time, because there was throwdown value to something that said, look, there are scans, there's research, there's, you know, we know this. And two days ago, there was, was an article in the uh, Times, in the business section of the Times, about, Jim, did anyone see that, about James Heckman talking about um, uh, early childhood and the importance of, that we're making the investments in the wrong place by not investing early. And I thought, wow, we've gone from, you know, from the uh, women's pages to the business pages. So I, I, I'm actually, I'm not so much concerned about how much coverage there is, but the type of coverage, and that it doesn't turn into this um, baby Einstein um, kind of thing that we've seen so much of. More to say about that, but wrong place. We have time. Wrong time. One more question. Yes. I think that's what we have. Jerry. Hi. Um, I saw Diane Ravitch speak last week, and I left the lecture feeling very informed and very depressed. <laughs> um, one of the questions I wish I had asked, I, I was just overwhelmed with all the information, was, um, you know, Diane talked about um, congressmen calling her saying, what do you think about the new Common Core standards? And she said they need to be piloted in a few t uh, states. And they said, there is no time, you know? So the comments about um, looking for the cracks in the sidewalk and disaggregation have kind of, um, uh, make me clarify what my, my dilemma is, is that, you know, I sit on in-school support teams and I feel like kids are picked apart. And, um, you know, I look for what the kid, child can do and remediate from there. Uh, my position has just been accessed in my district. They let go of 12 remedial reading teachers. They hired five literacy coaches, most of whom are 25 years old, untenured classroom teachers. Um, but, you know, in all my lectures I hear 
who blamed corporate America for imposing their ideas on education, blamed the elected officials, blamed the government. You know, um, we are the government. And I've had many debates with my uh, state assemblywoman, who's a former teacher, and um, called her out, you know, in public. But where, where I feel that I don't know what to do is with parents. You know, I sit on CSE meetings and I'm not invited anymore. And these parents don't challenge, you know. It, well, maybe one in 10 will say, my kid is not learned disabled. Um, and what I say to parents is, you know your kid best. You have the picture of the whole child. But they're so frightened, you know. It, you know, we try to get p parents to go to the board meeting about the cuts. And, um, and that's, you know, that's the level at which I think maybe I could affect the most change. Um, but people have bought in, you know, and I think about, I lived in Europe for two years. I taught uh, in Spain, and when I came back, I, people asked me, what did you learn there? And I said, I learned a lot about what it is to be an American. And I would say, maybe, you know, it was, it was 20 years ago, five people have said to me, what have you learned? When I didn't come back an expert, you know, on what was going on in Europe, um, nobody was interested. You know, so I guess my question is to you. I mean, I don't know where I'm going to go from here. Um, I've applied at a couple universities, and I have interviews coming up, um, and I've taught at uh, universities before. But I, I just feel like, I'm, you know, I feel helpless. And, it, and, and when people start to argue and denigrate teachers, um, my response has been, it's not about us. It's about kids, you know? So, you know, maybe you could give me a little insight on how, you know, I could empower people to to confront this situation you know because it's easy to lay blame and and uh, we can't do it alone teachers can't do it alone so thank you you know for your words of wisdom today <laughs> yes I know I'm, I'm just thinking about that and I think that's a I don't want to leave on a note that feels a little disheartening, but I also, go ahead before I want to. Yeah. Say, I'd like to just go. respond and say that wherever you are, yeah. whatever context you're in, it's important to speak up about your beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. And to speak up not just against what is, but to speak up about what you stand for. And we need to do it as women, <laughs> we need to do it as parents, we need to do it as educators, and in the field of early childhood, we need to do it for our profession. And we need to claim what the truth is for, for us. And hopefully that'll get us stronger. Well, I want to just, we're going to move into our, um, into the sessions, and if, you know, I think we, I leave here with a few thoughts, just that, and again, thinking back to Joe's talk yesterday, we, we look to our history, to our hybrids, there are many hybrids amongst us, and, pu and then they're the purists. We've got to look for those cracks that Beverly talked about, so important, the big ideas, and we have to be intentional, and we have to, I think, reclaiming the whole is so important, and that goes right back to you. I'm thinking about that. So take that with you this morning. Um, enjoy the next part of your day. And Jerry, you have yeah. a quick Thank announcement. you. I just wanted your attention for two minutes. The first thing is, um, the first thing is I really want to thank uh, our panel. It was incredibly rich. I learned so much.